Hello. The purpose of this presentation is to give you a brief summary and overview of Dr. William Glasser's Choice Theory Psychology and to explain some of its major applications in the context of that psychology. These are reality therapy, personal well-being, the Glasser Quality Schools and lead management. And as we shall see, there are other possible applications of this choice theory psychology. Dr. William Glasser himself was born in Cleveland, Ohio, United States in 1925. And after an uneventful childhood, he studied chemical engineering and then psychology and eventually psychiatry. And when he started working as a psychiatrist, it was in the field of education with a group of uh, adolescent girls who had been classified as delinquent and that was in the Ventura School in California. In 1965 he published what was to be his best known work, Reality Therapy, and this uh, is the foundation of his approach to counselling, which was later to be helped by the, ther the theory that we call Choice Theory Psychology. In 1969, he published his first major book about education, Schools Without Failure, showing that he could cover these two areas of therapy and education. And in 1990, he published The Quality School as a follow-up to the Schools Without Failure. But his most important book of all was in 1998 when he published Choice Theory. And this is the explanation of his Choice Theory psychology which we are talking about today. Throughout his life, Glasser has been influenced by a number of people, the first being Harrington, a Dr. Harrington, who was his mentor when he was studying psychiatry. Uh, this gave rise to his ideas and the sense of choice in a person's life. Uh, his very first book, Mental Health or Mental Illness, Reality Therapy, Schools Without Failure, followed by the Identity Society and Positive Addiction. Then he learned about the ideas of William Powers and his control theory, an idea that Powers had adapted from the field of engineering to the field of psychology. Glasser was very impressed by this and wrote several books under the heading of control theory. Later, around the 1990s, he became more familiar with the work of Edward Stemming. Edward Stemming was the statistician who in post-war Japan had helped them come to their feet again and create the success that was the Japanese industry. From this, Glasser adapted ideas and built them into the quality school, the quality school teacher, the, co the control theory manager, and uh, eventually staying together, a book about relationships. In 1998, as I said, he published Choice Theory Psychology because by that stage, the name choice theory was more meaningful than that of control theory. And the ideas that he had taken from powers had traveled a long way in his practice and his application of them. And there were a number of critical differences. So it became choice theory. He published a number of books, started rewriting a lot of his ideas in the context of choice theory, the language of choice theory, reality therapy and action, creating the competence-based classroom, getting together and staying together. Every student can succeed was a new version or a new, a new application of his ideas to the school. He wrote a number of other books. What is this thing called love? A very uh, profound look at relationships. Counseling with choice theory and new reality therapy. He wrote about fibromyalgia, unhappy teenagers. And then finally his last book written completely by himself was Warning, psychiatry can be hazardous to your mental health. A challenge to the psychiatric practice of using medication instead of psychology. If we look at choice theory as the heart of Glasser's ideas, we find that the applications of reality therapy, quality schools, lead management and personal well-being are the major ones and flow directly from his ideas in choice theory. But there are lots of other applications possible. For example, work in the community, coaching, relationships, parenting, and the list goes on. First of all, let's focus on choice theory itself. What exactly does it tell us? According to Glasser, 
we all work on the basis of having five major basic needs. The first of these we would identify as love and belonging. The need to love and care for other people, to be loved and cared for, the need to belong to a group. This is very, very deep in our psyche. Another need is the need for power. And Glasser says this very often conflicts with love and belonging. But it is the need for power in the good sense. The power like the power of a charged battery. The power to live your life. The power to control your own life. Related to that is the need for fun. And Glasser sees fun as very much associated with learning, with developing new skills, with adapting to the environment. And the need for freedom. Without freedom, we cannot satisfy our other needs. Without this ability to be ourselves, the ability to do what we want to do. And deep-seated in all of this is the need, this physical need for survival, the need for warmth and health, for protection, uh, all of these things. And in fact, Glasser says that in the evolution of the species, it is very likely that survival was there first. And as we became more and more human, then the psychological needs of love and belonging, power, fun and freedom evolved. I like to represent it in a cone diagram like this. At the very heart of our existence are these basic needs. Survival, love and belonging, power, freedom and fun. And Glasser says you can call the needs by any name you wish. You can have as many as you wish. This is the number that he has. Now we don't go around thinking in terms of our needs. We think in terms of ideas and pictures and perceptions that we have accumulated throughout our life as ways of meeting our needs. And each person has accumulated their own set. Some of these come from our individual experiences. Some come from our culture. Some come from the vicarious experiences of people we admire. The pictures can be things, people, places, values, and these pictures are tied together by their own inner logic. Now these pictures exist in our mind, but we try to make them happen in real life. And that's where they flow into the area of behaviour. The behaviour is the external manifestation of what's going on in our picture album, what Glasser calls our quality world. According to Glasser, and this is a, one of his major contributions to psychology, According to him, behaviour is an inseparable totality of four components. Acting or doing, thinking, feeling, and what's going on in the body, the physiology. We cannot separate these. Everything we do is made up of these four inseparable components. And this idea has lots of implications for the way we live our lives and for the way we try to help others through therapy. Let's look at an example. If my love and belonging need is running a little bit low at the moment, I might think of some way of improving that. My system works like a, a thermostatic valve that says something is running low, switch on a way of satisfying that need. So I might think, OK, I will give a flower to someone I love. Other people have other pictures. It may be a box of chocolates. It may be a holiday, whatever it is. I choose one of the pictures from my personal album and then I give the rose, that's the doing. I'm thinking my partner will love this. I'm feeling warm and romantic and physiology, my heart is fluttering. A totality that comes about in the action of giving the flower to a person I love. So the behaviour flows from the pictures which in turn flow from the needs. As human beings, we don't tend to think very much about our needs but we think a lot about our pictures. And by the way, these pictures can be destructive as well. If one of my need satisfying pictures is to destroy other human beings, then I might do that. And unfortunately, our newspapers every day give stories of people who are satisfying pictures that are very socially unacceptable. If we work on the basis of internal basic needs and internal pictures. Therefore, I control myself. I cannot control you and you cannot control me. These are central ideas to choice theory psychology. And of course, I control myself by making my own choices. And I usually have more choices than I think I have. 
My pictures are always good. The pictures, the ideas I put into my album are always good. That's why I put them there. Now, it doesn't mean they're good for other people. It's simply, I mean, from my point of view, they, are, they look good. I always choose the best I can. Why would I do otherwise? The best I can doesn't mean it's good enough for you. It may even mean it's harmful to you or other people. But it's the best I can. And I'm always choosing to restore a balance to my needs. That's what choice is. Choice is putting into behaviour something that will achieve a picture that will rebalance my needs or satisfy my needs. My behaviour is a totality of four components, but sometimes I may choose creative or crazy behaviours. If I don't have behaviours ready, if I don't have pictures there that will satisfy my needs, I may come up with some that are unrealistic, that are crazy, that are illogical, however you want to describe them. And that brings us neatly to the second component, the first major application of choice theory psychology, reality therapy. Reality therapy was what brought Glasser to fame, but he soon found that there was more to the therapy than simply a way of helping others. It was, in fact, as he described on one occasion, a way of life. And it was this that led him to look for a theory to explain what was going on. And that is how he came to choice theory psychology. Basically, if we return to the cone diagram, we can see that the processes of reality therapy are processes that bring us inside the existence of the other person, inside their psychological structures. Through involvement with the person, we enter into their world and we are able to examine with their help their current pictures that are driving their behaviour and their current behaviours. We reach a point where we help them make a self-evaluation about their lives, that what they're doing to achieve their pictures is not working. That's why they've come to counselling. And once they have made that, and only they can make that evaluation, then it is possible with, with the therapist's help to look at new pictures and or new behaviours and then to put some planning in place to help those uh, become reality. So reality therapy is very much about respecting the individual's choice, the individual's control of themselves and building the therapy around those ideas. For that reason, we tend to focus very much on two components, the pictures, what is it that you want to be, and the behaviour, what is it that you are doing? What is it that you're doing to try to achieve the pictures in your, in your album? And by focusing on that, then we then can help the person focus on new pictures and new behaviours, new choices. Some of the characteristics of reality therapy, it's all about choice. We use the language of choice. We talk about choice a lot in the therapy. It's about the present because we believe that the past only exists in present pictures. The past only exists in the present in, in so far as we remember things from the past and we behave according to our memories, not according to the reality of the past. It's phenomenology. It's about perceptions. It's about how the client sees things, not about how the therapist sees things or what the real world is supposed to be. Total behaviour, this idea of the four inseparable components, is absolutely central to the idea of ideas of reality therapy. For example, when a person is depressing, it is part of their physiology, it is part of their thinking, it is part of their doing, and it is part of their feeling. So we will focus on which components we can help them change, and the easiest to change are the components of doing and thinking. Feeling and physiology normally accompany those will change if the other two change. Reality therapy is very action oriented. There is an idea of changing your life, of looking for change, of planning and so on. It is also swift. It tends to be very, very fast compared with some other therapies. We tend to move forward looking for new behaviours, new choices that will help the person lead a more satisfying life. The next aspect of choice theory psychology we want to look at is personal well-being, sometimes referred to as mental health. Personal well-being is becoming increasingly central to the ideas of Dr. Glasser. If we reflect back on the central concepts of choice theory, 
there's a lot there for personal well-being. I can only control myself. I cannot control you. You cannot control me. But we may be able to get along together. The world tends to work on the opposite, what Glasser calls the psychology of external control. That you control me and I try to control you and we're all trying to control each other. And that is leading to bad relationships, is leading to a lack of personal well-being and to a lot of unhappiness. So these are very central ideas. I can only control myself, I cannot control you and you cannot control me. In fact, Glasser says the seven deadly habits of external control psychology are criticism, blaming, complaining, nagging, threatening, punishing and bribing. These are signs that we're trying to control another person or that we believe that our own lives are controlled. And Glasser believes if we can eradicate these from our lives, even for a few days, it will make a massive difference. He in fact suggests seven other habits that we use instead of the seven deadly habits. Listening, supporting, encouraging, respecting, trusting, accepting and negotiating. That these are at the heart of of personal well-being. A sample of choice theory psychology thinking and this is something that a person could try out in their own lives as a way of improving their personal well-being. Think of something that's not the way you want it to be in your life. Write it down. Write down a list of these things. How do you want it to be? Spell it out in very specific detail. What have you done so far to rectify this or to achieve this? Think about what you've done. You've done your best. So what was that? Then ask yourself this very important self-evaluative question. Have your efforts so far got you what you want? Be firm and honest with yourself. Whatever you did so far it was the best you knew how to do. You wouldn't have done otherwise. So there's no point in blaming or feeling guilty about what happened in the past. Then consider in this whole area who can you control? Who have you control over? And of course the answer is yourself. Is there something you can do about this today yourself? Preferably something that is very, very achievable for you. You don't choose something that's going to be extremely difficult. Make the first step a step that you will do with success. Spell out the what, when, where, who and how of your plan. Good plans require lots of good details. If you don't know what to do, which is very possible, is there someone who might help you find a solution? Is there a book, a person, a phone number, someone you can go to? And then if your first plan doesn't work well, what do you need to change? Plans don't necessarily work well the first time, they may need adjustment. These are a sample of ideas of how choice theory psychology might help a person improve their life. The next area we're going to look at is that of the quality schools. Glasser began his career working with delinquent girls in the Ventura School. It gave him an insight into the world of therapy and the world of education, two insights he has never departed from. He would say that the problems in our school systems all around the world are low levels of achievement, discipline problems, poor attendance and punctuality, students who reject subjects and even learning itself. And then he says, because this low quality, standardised, fragmented approach is so unsatisfying to students and teachers, more and more students are actively resisting. And this resistance is seen as a discipline problem. School administrators, he says, then fall into the trap of thinking that discipline problems, not unsatisfying education, are the cause of low levels of achievement. This is a very significant quote from Dr. Glasser from the Quality School, published in 1990. People think that discipline problems cause the mediocre results. If we could solve the discipline problems, we would get better results. And Glasser says, no, it is unsatisfying education, which gives rise to discipline problems. It also gives rise to mediocre results. And of course, both of these have an interaction. The discipline problems and mediocre results will impinge on each other. If we are to change this situation, we need to change unsatisfying education. 
Glasser compares this to divorce. When a couple are divorcing, one takes the other out of their quality world. They are no longer a need-satisfying entity in that world. And sadly, this also happens in the field of education, where the student takes education, adult society, teachers, learning out of his or her quality world. And therefore, it is not going to invest any behaviour in that educational process. Glasser identifies six characteristics of the Glasser Quality School. These are characteristics which are not a mark of achievement, but a mark of progress. Number one, all relationships are based upon trust and respect and all discipline problems, not incidents, have been eliminated. Number two, total learning competency is stressed and an evaluation that is below competence or what is now a B grade has been eliminated. All schooling, as defined by Dr. William Glasser, has been replaced by useful education. Number three, all students do some quality work each year that is significantly beyond competence. All such work receives an A grade or higher, such as an A plus. Number four, students and staff are taught to use choice theory psychology in their lives and in their work in school. Parents are encouraged to participate in study groups and they become familiar with the ideas of Dr. William Glasser. Number five, students do better on state proficiency tests and college entrance examinations. The importance of these tests is emphasised in the school. And finally, number six, and this is a very important one, staff, students, parents and administrators view the school as a joyful place. These six characteristics are not daydreams of Dr Glasser. These are the six characteristics that a school must present if they want to call themselves a Glasser quality school. I've had the good fortune of visiting a number of these schools or being visited by them. I can vouch for the fact that these six characteristics are found in, in these schools. For example, in North Carolina, the uh, Murray High School, uh, in the high school in Pasim, Croatia, uh, the school uh, which is both elementary and middle and senior high, Ljubljana in Slovenia. Uh, again, a full range school from age four to age 18 in Bogota, Colombia, Colegio Rochester and Youth Reach in Trim in, here in Ireland. All of these have adopted the ideas of Dr. William Glasser and are what we call Glasser quality schools. The next item I want to look at is lead management. Uh, and this in some ways is perhaps the area of choice theory psychology that needs more development. Uh, needs more application. In the ideas of choice theory psychology, you cannot control another human being. But that is exactly what a boss manager does. He or she tries to control his or her workers. On the other hand, the leader, uh, the lead manager, will work with the, the workers, will try to influence them, of course, but will not try to control them. So where the boss imposes jobs and standards, the leader has discussions about the quality of the work. Where the boss tells rather than shows, the leader will show or model the work, will, will get in there working with the, the actual workers. Where the boss inspects or grades work, an external examiner all the time criticising what the workers are doing, the leader invites workers to evaluate their own work. Where the boss will use coercion, force, threats, punishment, the leader will collaborate and it's not adversarial. This is a very, very radical difference from the traditional approach. The lead manager is very different from the boss manager. The image on the left may seem to be an exaggeration, but in fact, when you try to control other people, you are essentially putting them down. The lead manager is still the, the, the leader of the company or the group, but works with them very very different basic psychology of working together. How then can you get training in choice theory psychology? At the moment the main focus is on reality therapy but new courses are being developed as we speak to apply to, apply to all the areas I have mentioned. It normally starts with what's called a basic intensive week or a basic intensive course which can be about 30 hours of tuition and a small group 
and uh, with a faculty member of William Glasser International. That is followed by a practicum period. Very often people will have their basic intensive training in the summer and when they have more time and then carry on the practicum over the winter months. The next stage then is an advanced intensive week or an advanced intensive course, it may not be a week, and then followed by an advanced practicum and finally by certification where people come together and show what they have learned and celebrate their learning and learn from each other. In Europe, we have added new levels to that, that a person can then continue, uh, provided they have the necessary qualifications and the choice theory psychology training to become uh, European certified in psychotherapy. So this is a new level of training. On the internet, uh, you can get ideas about choice theory psychology from the William Glasser International, the website being www.wglasserinternational.org and also in Ireland, the William Glasser Institute Ireland, www.wgii.ie. Thank you for your attention and I hope that you have learned a little bit about choice theory psychology.